Welcome to Summerlin Church and to our teaching series on the body of Christ, a, a huge concept that we're beginning to look into and, and more than a concept, uh, a reality to be experienced. But first, let me welcome all of you who are uh, watching this from other parts of the country and other parts of the world, as well as our folks who normally would meet in this church. So I just welcome all of you. Some of you friends are watching from India. I give you greetings. Some from Ecuador, bienvenidos. Uh, we're glad that you're, you're with us here this morning. I want to start with a scripture, and the scripture is from the first letter of John. He says this, This is the message which we've heard from Christ, and we declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We're talking about the body of Christ. And I would plan to talk a little more uh, over the next three Sundays about uh, our individual personality types and how they fit into the interconnectedness of the body of Christ. But as I thought about it this week, it, uh, it hit me that I've overlooked something so central. Uh, it, was, it was too close to see, and I want to focus on it uh, with a, a little story to begin with. Imagine we, we live here. This is coming to you from Summerlin, California. The beach is literally two blocks away from where I'm sitting. The waves roll in. One, one of the greatest surfing spots on the West Coast is about three miles down the road uh, called Rincon Point. And whenever I drive down there, I look to see the surfers coming in on these great waves. Or if it's flat, I see the surfers all sort of sad about it. And uh, now I want you to imagine that kids grow up here surfing all the time. My, my sons, for example, would get up before sunrise to go surf. So they'd get an hour and a half of surfing in before they went to school. So people growing up around here, it's just part of their life. If you grew up like I did, however, in the Midwestern part of the United States, where the biggest hill is about three feet high, and it's flat like this, and there's no ocean, maybe a lake or two, so you could water ski, but surfing, uh, not so much. So imagine you're from, let's say, Kansas. I'll pick on Kansas. And uh, you're out in the wheat fields of canvas, but you keep thinking about surfing. And you start getting books and magazines and looking at the internet and, and watching all the famous surf contests. And you begin to learn about it. And you learn that, oh, some of the best boards are made right in Sa Santa Barbara uh, by Al Merrick, who lived right down the street from me when uh, we were younger. And you learn all these, and you learn techniques and how it would go. And then finally the day comes, and you decide to move to, camp, to, to uh, Santa Barbara and Summerland, and, and you're going to throw yourself into surfing. And you, you even hire, like, the best surfer in the area to give you lessons. And, and as you're getting ready for your first day to go out into the, the waves, uh, the, the instructor says, to you, okay, now let's, we're going to swim out there, and, and you... And you you, you sort of hesitate. And the instructor says, yeah, we're going to swim a little bit just to warm up, and then we'll get on our boards and go on out. And you say something like this. Uh, actually, Kansans don't really have much of an accent, so I can't do a Kansas accent. But you say to your surfing instructor, um, sw swim? Uh, I, don't, I don't actually know how to swim. It's kind of important if you want to be a surfer. There's something so central to it that you might have overlooked it and thought, if you know all the techniques, if you've read about it, that maybe you just overlook the fact that you can't swim. It's a bit like that when we're talking about the body of Christ. There's something so essential that we could miss it easily. We could talk about fellowship, which is the experience within the body of Christ, a love for one another, uh, a service with one another, a connectedness and interconnectedness together. But we could overlook, that's the surfing part. We could overlook the central importance of something else, something much greater, like being able to swim. What is it? 
I want to read, and I'm going to be quoting somewhat extensively from a little book by Thomas Kelly, very little book. Uh, it's one of my life books. You ought to have several life books that you just go through and read and reread over the years, ones that really nurture you. This is by Thomas Kelly. We'll have it on our website. It's called uh, A Testament of Devotion. But one of the chapters is called The Blessed Community. And he talks about the body of Christ. He doesn't use those terms. He, he uses beautiful other terms. He comes from the Quaker tradition. So he's using different terminology than my tradition, which is wonderful. It helps me uh, see things from a different angle. And he says this in the opening sentences of the blessed community. He says, when we're drowned in the overwhelming seas of the love of God, we find ourselves in a new relation to some of our friends. Well, let's just stop there. When we find ourselves, when we are drowned in the overwhelming sea of the love of God, let's just stop there. Uh, are you drowned in the overwhelming sea of the love of God? You see, that's quite different than church going, Bible reading, even saying your prayers. It's quite different than having a, a, an immaculate theology, of which I'm not sure there is such a thing. It's quite different than having uh, reading lots of good spiritual books or even doing some spiritual practices. There's something so central, so core about it. It's like the love versus the marriage. You can have a marriage without love, but what is it? You need the love, you need the experience, you need the connectedness between two people to make a marriage work over decades and decades of, of joys and sorrows and tragedies and triumphs. And that experience for us in the body of Christ, to experience the body of Christ, is to be drowned, soaked, immersed in the love of God, experientially. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a big uh, emotional experience every day, but it means that somewhere in there you're connected to that love of God. Thomas Kelly goes on and says there's a whole new alignment of our personal relationships when we begin to experience this thing that, that's hard to find a word for. In fact, he says uh, the word fellowship is found, but it's so bland. It, it, it's, it's so pale compared to what he calls the luminous bulk of the experience of being in Christ in a deep way, in the center with a capital C. What is that? It's so surprising. He says it's so rich. And when you experience that with God, when you experience that with Christ and with the Holy Spirit, a whole new alignment of friendships takes place. Some of your friendships will loom uh, larger. There'll, there'll be people who've had this same experience. And the interesting thing is you may have just met them, but because they are uh, experienced thing, that, that, that drowning in the sea of God's love, and you're experiencing it, even though you've just met and you've spent 20 minutes together, there's a bonding, there's a connection, which we call fellowship. The, the New Testament word is koinonia, the word I'm going to use today is the blessed community or the beloved community, which Martin Luther King Jr. spoke so much about. Well, we just uh, had a memorial for Congressman John Lewis, a civil rights activist, died at 80 years old. I've been in uh, some meetings when I worked in Washington, D.C., where he was a part of them and heard his story somewhat firsthand. And now the whole world is beginning to see what a, what a solid and great man this was of nonviolence, of what he called love, which meant was always nonviolent, though it was action. They call it nonviolent loving action. And he worked for justice, and he was steady, and he was solid, and he was so committed that being beaten up uh, on the uh, bridge, the famous bridge in the march uh, during the civil rights uh, movement, uh, it didn't matter to him because he was so committed to something deeper and bigger. And for him, it was God. Uh, the techniques he learned about nonviolence came from Gandhi through Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who had studied Gandhi. But 
Interestingly, if you read Gandhi's own autobiography, he says, this isn't an autobiography. This is the story of my experiments with truth. Uh, that's the title he wanted for his autobiography. He said, it's not an autobiography. It's, it, it's a, a telling of my experiments with truth. And truth with a capital T for Gandhi meant God. And he says that very clearly. And he talks about how much he learned from Jesus as well, which is where he actually got the idea of nonviolent action, nonviolent uh, resistance. Uh, when Jesus said, love your enemy. If somebody uh, hits you on the right cheek, cheek turn to him the other. So for Gandhi, it was a nonviolence which meant love or truth, which ultimately meant God. And Gandhi's whole life was an experiment of trying to get closer and closer to a harmony, a unity with God. The same with Martin Luther King Jr., the same with John Lewis. But they didn't do it alone. Gandhi lived in community all his life. For the tw first 20 years of his uh, career, he lived not in India, in South Africa, where he worked for social justice there and began experimenting with living in community, a blessed community. Same with John Lewis in the early days of the civil rights movement. There was this gathering around Nashville, which I heard in several interviews, they saw as divinely inspired that God and God's own self had brought these people together and they found one another in their love of God and their love for justice and they went the long haul together. That's a blessed community. And so there's a whole realignment when you experience the love of God and meet someone else who's experienced that love, in this case, the cases I'm talking about, and who's also working for the same truth or justice that you're working for. Uh, they come together, they loom larger than maybe some of the people you knew all along. Some of the other friends you have are realigned and they recede because as Kelly says, Thomas Kelly, uh, their lives have been lived closer to the surface. The blessed community, Kelly speaking again, has always astonished those who stood outside and for those who stood inside. It's astounding is the word he uses, which is interesting because that is the word that is most used about Jesus when he was on earth. The most used word to explain how people experienced the real physical Jesus was that they were astonished. That we might say today they were blown away. Uh, they stood in awe. They were shocked. They were amazed, as another, another translation says, utterly amazed. If we're drowned in the sea of the love of God, it takes on a feeling of utter amazement. And Kelly says that every period of a profound rediscovery of God's joyous immediacy, I love that phrase, joyous immediacy. Is God joyously immediate to you? Or, or is God a subject out there you're considering? Almost like a commodity, commodity that you're thinking, well, maybe I'll buy it, maybe I won't. Or is God a a joyous immediacy, because God is joyously immediate to all of us. Whenever there's an experience of this joyous immediacy, there's also an appearance of an, what he calls an amazing group interconnectedness. That's fellowship. A deep experience of God's immediacy creates a deep experience of human interconnectedness of the God enthralled. I love that phrase, the God enthralled. Are you enthralled with God? Or do you just believe in God or wonder about God? And we're all on a journey. There's a place for all of those things. But ultimately, you know, it's not enough to date. It's not enough to get to know somebody. It's not enough to start feeling a little bit of love. You want to give your whole heart and life to that person if you love them deeply. And that's the way it's meant to be with us and with God. In this kind of fellowship, in this kind of body of Christ, blessed community, all differences are relegated to nothing. Paul says uh, there's no slave or free. In his, in his day and age, there were slaves everywhere, and slaves were not even considered human. And yet slaves came to know the overwhelming sea of the love of God, and owners came to know, owners of slaves. And he says, in this love, there's no difference between slave and free. That, that was the death nail 
to slavery, at least uh, as a concept that anyone could support. The God-enthralled people see that there's no difference. That, that means there's a welcome for all people. I want to read this one quote from Kelly. I, I think says it well. On all people, the wooing love of God falls urgently. So on all people, God's love, as you've heard me say many times, is coming toward all of you all the time through everything with love. God is coming toward you with joyous immediacy right now while you're listening to this, while you're watching this. And God is coming to you with joyous immediacy when you're walking or driving your car or having a fight with somebody in your family. God is right around you coming toward you in joyous immediacy, the joyous immediacy of God's unconquerable love. The only question is, are we open to it? Are we seeing it? Are we yielding to it? So he goes on and says, on all the wooing love of God falls urgently. But the one who yields, the one who yields to the love knocking on the door of his or her life, to that one, their heart is being knocked on and it will be entered it will be possessed by love, it will be transformed by love, and it will be transfigured in love, my paraphrase. Entered, possessed, transformed, transfigured. And the boundaries of yourself will be enlarged. You know, it's interesting that when we have this experience of being God enthralled, Christ enthralled, spirit enthralled, they're, they're, it takes a yielding. It, it, it takes uh, a, an intentionality. It takes a letting go, a surrender. I don't know how many different words we could use, hundreds probably. But it takes some sort of willful decision inside of us. And in fact, it takes ongoing willful decisions. Uh, I married Linda 50, almost, well, going on 51 years now ago. And you've heard the old joke about the a uh, man and the woman that were married for 40 years or 50 years. And, and finally the wife said, John, I, you know, why don't you ever tell me you love me? I always heard it. They were farmers in, in Minnesota. Uh, and he said, well, I told you on the day I married you. And if I changed my mind, I would have let you know. Well, you know, that doesn't make for a good marriage. You would tell one another you love each other, hopefully daily or more than daily. And you don't just live it out, you say it. And, and there's this, this sense of that in our relationship with God when we turn our will over to God, when we open ourselves to the drowning love of God in our hearts, uh, we're entered. The Spirit of God actually, I actually would say, we realize we've been entered. We realize that God was there uh, through the Spirit all along. And we, we experience that. And then we're possessed. As Kelly says in another place, we are owned men and women in joyous enslavement, kind of an oxymoron. But when it comes to God, it, it makes sense. We're owned. We're not our own. We're, we're, we're possessed not, not like possessed like a demon, possessed by love, possessed, possessed by forgiveness and, and uh, compassion. And because of that, we're transformed, which is one of my greatest frustrations in the work I do is seeing how little transformation I see, it, sometimes in my own life as well, and, and, and in, in the life of, of real solid church members. Bible-believing, Jesus-loving people, sometimes I don't see that I see a, a lack of transformation. But if we're possessed, we're, that means we're controlled by a different spirit than our own, in this case, the Holy Spirit of love. And that love is meant to slowly but surely transform us into the image of Christ, which is an image of compassion. And finally, we're transfigured. That's a great word. Jesus was transfigured. You know, we call it the Mount of Transfiguration. He, he mystically turned pure white, and, and uh, uh, Elijah the prophet was on one side, and Moses the prophet on the other, and the disciples were, you know, so amazed they fell to the ground. 
When you're transfigured, it means that you have actually become your message. Every ounce of you, your fingers, your toes, your, all of your body, your thoughts, your mind, your soul, you, you, you have embodied the message of love, not just believed in it. And that's a journey. That's a, obviously, uh, we don't all make it. In fact, uh, uh, none of us make it fully, according to Paul. But we keep trying to inch along so that more and more our life is transformed and hopefully transfigured. I know people right here in this congregation, when I'm in their presence, I feel like I'm in the presence of Christ. They've been not only entered, not only possessed, not only transformed, but they're transfigured. You just that, and in, in our cases, it doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means there's something of the spirit that has saturated you so much that it just comes through your pores almost. So this body of Christ, this interconnected fellowship of the God enthralled, is a welcoming fellowship, always welcoming, always offering a place to belong to anyone who knocks on the door. Always encouraging, never judging. Always encouraging, never judging. Guiding, but without that judgment I mentioned. Forgiving when that's appropriate. Introducing, it never is possessive. This sort of fellowship doesn't say, hey, he or she is my friend, I'm going to hold them for myself. They are introduced to the rest. When people came to Jesus, literally the physical Jesus who walked the earth, they met a whole bunch of other people who had come to Jesus. You didn't just meet Jesus, you were then introduced to others who were becoming Christ enthralled. But this sort of flow, this sort of connectedness that I'm calling the blessed community, the root experience is a yielding of yourself to the love of God expressed in Jesus born out through the Holy Spirit in your own life. It's that. It's, it, it is a total surrender. Time and time again, surrender more of you know of yourself to more of what you know of God. It's that God-enthralled, joyous immediacy that then creates the fellowship. That's why I read that scripture where it says, if we walk in the light, that's the yielding. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. If we're walking in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We, we don't create fellowship. I've seen people try to do that in churches through small groups, and I'm all for small groups. But, you know, fellowship, you don't create it. You deepen yourself in God, and then when you meet others who are deepened in him, maybe in your small group, fellowship happens. If we walk in the light, As Christ was in the light, we have the blessed community with one another.